Good morning, everyone. If anyone else wants to get up and walk out, now is the time. I'm only kidding. We've locked, we've locked the doors. You're in here for the long haul now. So, uh. Hey, uh, how many of you have been on a cruise ship before? Have some of you been been on a cruise ship before? Yeah, a few of you. It's good fun. I, a couple of years ago, my family and I um, uh, went on a cruise first time, and we had a great uh, time. Very enjoyable. Um, you know, you eat too much, and it's you know, there's all this entertainment and stuff. It's good fun. And um, but uh, I had never really spent a lot of time on. Uh, on ships or, or boats before. The only time I'd been in a boat was when you uh, get into a you know a little dinghy or something. You sat down. You go where you're going. You get off again. And uh, so um, so the first day on the cruise ship, um, they're giving us a bit of a pep talk and and telling us about it. And they said, now just it's going to take you a little while to find your sea legs. And I thought, what are they talking about? Sea legs. You know, and uh, and so I was a little bit cocky. I thought the first day I'm walking around the boat, not a problem. I thought I've got this down pat. I thought I found my sea legs, beauty. Well, the next day I look out the window. The, the, the ocean wasn't that choppy. There was no storms on or anything like that. I'm walking along, and there's people around me, and all of a sudden, whoa! We all go this way. It's a bit weird. And so, you know, keep, keep walking, and then, whoa, you go this way. And it's like, and I had not had a drop to drink. A few other people on the ship had, and I wondered how they were still standing upright. But uh, I'll tell you what, life can be a bit like that. When the seas of life are calm, it's very easy to stand firm and to stand your ground and to plant your feet and say, I will not be moved. When things get a bit choppy and the boat's swaying from side to side and we feel like the very ground is being swept from underneath us, it's much harder to stand your ground, yeah? That's why we've got to be ready. As Christians, if we come under attack for our faith and the things we believe, we've got to be prepared what to say and how to say it very important. It takes courage to speak the truth. Well, I'll tell you what, it takes wisdom to speak the truth in love. Look at Israel Folau and his uh, tweet. Now, as a Christian, I might say, look, there was an element of truth. I don't think he was very wise about the way he worded it and put it up, paraphrased scripture. Um, And I defend his right to be able to say that as well. However, he wasn't that wise about it, I don't think. And uh, and it's you know it's attracted a lot of media attention. Today we're talking about how to communicate truth to a culture that doesn't believe in absolute truth. In this postmodern generation. We're now post-postmodern, aren't we, I suppose? But uh, there are people who believe, hey, I can create my own truth, I can believe my, my own truth, I can create my own values, and what's good for me is okay, and I don't have to line up with anybody else. Well, there are some things in life that are absolute. And if you don't believe them, you're living a lie. In week one, we talked about standing out, having Christian values and allowing our values to be seen. And then last week, we talked about standing up, not hiding away, but staying true to who you are. And this week, standing firm, knowing what you believe about Jesus and how to stand firm in that. And we've also been looking at the book of Daniel, which I trust you've uh, been enjoying. I think it's a really uh, interesting book, Daniel. Uh, it was written at a time when, when Babylon was spiritually under siege. Uh, there were people who were just swept along with the crowd. And they believed anything, really, that they were told. If they were told to believe this, they went with it. If it, they were told to believe that, they went with it. And yet there were people 
like Daniel, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who stood firm. And they were magnificent men, really, who were, were in, in their day incredible role models and are incredible role models still to us as we read their stories. And they weren't afraid to stand firm in what they believed. And they weren't persuaded to change their allegiance to serving, uh, away from serving God. Now, in these first few chapters of Daniel, we also have King Nebuchadnezzar. We've talked a fair bit about him the last couple of weeks. I mean, he was a tyrant. He was an egomaniac. He was, he was a murderer. I mean, he could snap like that. And if he didn't like the way you looked at him, it was off with your head or into the furnace. I mean, he was... He was quite uh, crazy. So that's where we're picking up the story today. But all of that was about to change for Nebuchadnezzar. And so we're in chapter 4. If you've got a Bible or an app, you can follow along. Daniel chapter 4. We'll have the passages on screen here. So how did Daniel stand firm in what God called him to do? Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Life is good He's, things are going well. He's looking around, sitting, oh, I've got lots of nice things. I've got a great kingdom. Life is good. It's good to be the king. And then he has this dream, and it freaks him out. Now, how many of you here have ever had a crazy dream? Yeah? Some people say you probably shouldn't reveal too many of your dreams because it does kind of show something of, of your subconscious. Nate Rigney and I discovered that we, we share the same crazy dream, which is that we come into a church service, we're getting organised, and everything goes wrong in the service. The PA blows up, the, uh, the music, uh, the, oh, it just all goes wrong. I used to have one where I was officiating at a funeral and the body hadn't turned up yet, the coffin wasn't there. That says something about my subconscious, doesn't it? Hey, you ever had a scary dream? One where you just suddenly wake up and it's like, whoa, what was that all about? And five minutes later, you can barely remember it. You know, I used to kind of, when I had those kind of dreams, I'd wake up, I'd go, wow, that was weird, move on. Nowadays, if I, and I don't know, I don't often remember my dreams actually these days, but if I do, I say, wow, God, are you trying to, Tell me something through that. And much more often than not, God God reveals something to me through that. So I encourage you, if you have a crazy dream, take a moment to just ask God, is there something in that? Sometimes they're just crazy dreams. So this one really freaked Nebuchadnezzar out. He was terrified. Life was good on the outside, but something really shook him. And uh, what what the dream was about was he saw this big tree. Beautiful leaves, beautiful fruit on it, lots of beautiful birds perched in the tree. And all of a sudden, a voice says, strip that tree of its leaves and fruit and birds and cut it down. And the whole tree keels over. So Nebuchadnezzar was really disturbed by this dream. And Daniel was the only person he trusted to interpret it. Have a look what he says. Verse 18. So this is Nebuchadnezzar talking. This is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Belshazzar, which is Daniel, tell me what it means. Because none of my wise men in my kingdom, who obviously weren't that wise, uh, in my kingdom can interpret it for me. But you can. Because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Really interesting. For, For all his faults... Nebuchadnezzar recognized something in Daniel. Daniel had previously interpreted a dream for him. And, uh, and so he held Daniel in, in, in high esteem. And he recognized that there was something at work that wasn't Daniel's own ability. Um, but it was God at work uh, in him. And that's something for us as Christians to really aspire to that people would see God in us. Not us at work, but that they would see God uh, in us. So he trusted Daniel because Daniel had a good track record and a good reputation. 
Well, Daniel at first is a little bit shaken up by this. Uh, look what it says, verse 19. Then Daniel was greatly perplexed for a time and the thoughts terrified him because I think God, God gave him the interpretation. He's thinking, oh my gosh, how am I going to tell the king this dream is about him? And so the king picks up on this and he says, Daniel, he goes, don't let the dream or the meaning alarm you. Just You just tell me. Don't let such things alarm you. There are a lot of things in our world that can alarm us. In our outer world, you only got to flick on the news. Watch five minutes. Stories of wars. Watching our politicians bicker occasionally. And we're lucky in Australia. They are, they are mostly good. But you watch what goes on in, in, in other places around the world. Or just even natural disasters. You think, Lord, what is going on? It can be very unnerving. Or what about our inner world? Maybe there's relationship breakdowns going on. Maybe there's some desires and temptations that come up. You think, my gosh, where did that come from? Maybe it's struggling in our finances. A whole lot of things that go on in, in our personal life. Don't be alarmed. Be assured that God is at work. He is for us and not against us. Amen? And it's these kind of moments we rely on God and stand firm in what we know. And so we have to speak the truth, but we have to do it in love. And that's what Daniel does. He interprets the dream honestly. He doesn't shy away. He could have. He doesn't shy away from it, but he does it compassionately. Look how he, he does it beautifully. He starts off, Oh, my Lord, he's talking to the king. He goes, If only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversities. He's really trying to say, King, I'm preparing you for the bad news here. And so he tells him, the dream is about you, Nebuchadnezzar. All those things are going to happen to you. You're going to lose your kingdom. You're going to lose your sanity even. You're going to end up as an outcast, living like an animal, eating grass. And, uh, and it's going to be like that for seven years. Whew. Imagine having to pass on a word like that to somebody. Especially somebody who can chop your head off or throw you in a furnace. So he tells the king this, and at the end of it he says, So therefore, your majesty, please, please accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what's right, and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. He's really trying to appeal to him. He's not saying, hey, if you do good, you'll somehow win your salvation. But he's saying, if you genuinely open your heart to God and allow a transformation to take place then maybe your prosperity will continue. And so he pleads with the king and tries to appeal to him on the grounds of compassion and mercy. And I guess it worked because Nebuchadnezzar didn't kill him on the spot, which was good for Daniel. I think maybe he had learnt, actually, through the experience with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, uh, that there, there is a, a higher power at work here and that I better not tamper with it. So maybe he was a little bit, he was, I think he was on a journey by, by this time. I'll tell you what, we could really learn from Daniel. And if you ever have to speak the truth to someone, do it with love and mercy. Pray God, how, not, not just what to say, but how do I communicate this? Anyway, it comes to pass. Nebuchadnezzar lost his kingdom, he got kicked out. He loses his sanity. He ends up living like an animal for seven years. Uh, but at the end of it, it's restored to him. Have a look at this. Verse 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of heaven. Do you get a feeling something's happened here on the inside? He has really changed. Because everything... God does his right and all his ways are just. Now, you think about that. 
he's spent seven years living like an animal eating grass. That's pretty incredible to be able to come back and say, well, you know what? That was right. That was just. I deserve that. Whoa, that is pretty incredible. And those who walk in pride, God is able to humble. Well, I'll tell you what, I would rather stand firm in humility than be tripped up walking in pride any day of the week. What does it say in James? God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Well, anyway, Daniel stood firm. He had a responsibility and he had an opportunity and he was faithful in delivering the message that he did. But he did it in a way that maybe saved Nebuchadnezzar by uh, appealing to him. So what did Daniel have and what do we need to stand firm? Well, real simple. I don't have fancy sermon title headings today. I don't have my three points. I've got a big slab of scripture that I'm going to break up and move through. And you know what it is? It's in Ephesians 6, the armour of God. Let's have a look at that. Verse 11. It says, Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. The full armour of God. You can't just have one bit of the armour or a couple of bits. You imagine if six soldiers went out to fight and one of them said, well, I'm going to take the sword, you take the breastplate, uh, you take the, the, the shield and we should be okay between the six of us. It's like, what? That's dumb. Because the enemy is going to look for your point of vulnerability and uh, get you. No questions asked. You need the full armour of God. We need the full armour of God. And Paul gives us a, a, a really an excellent uh, illustration. Now, for us today, you know, we generally don't see people walking around in the street in armour unless they're going to like Comic-Con or something like that, uh, dressed up in some bizarre outfit. Um, but, of course, in Roman times, centurions were all over the place. And so people were very familiar with the concept of armour and, and these things. So they get the, the illustration. Important to note, it's a spiritual armour against spiritual schemes. Have a look at this next verse. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, very important, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Really important. We're not fighting people. We're fighting powers and principalities that would seek to set themselves up against Jesus and his kingdom. Things that would draw people away from Jesus. We're not fighting people. And so standing firm against ideas and actions that seek to draw people away from Jesus. Incidentally also means that we need to stand firm in drawing people to Jesus. And that's a whole other message. <laughs> so it says, therefore put on the full armour of God. So that when the day of evil comes, you might be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything, to stand. Why is it emphasising that, that thing of standing? It's not just about standing your own ground and protecting your own little territory. But it's about finishing the race well. Standing wherever you go so that at the end of the day, at the end of the race, when you have done everything... You're standing and you're standing well, not because of your own ability, but because, because by the grace of Jesus, he carries us through. Okay, so there's six aspects, six parts to this armour that Paul very uh, cleverly, uh, cleverly depicts. So let's have a look at each one. First of all, he says, what? Stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. A belt. For us, a belt holds our trousers up, gives you something to tuck your shirt into. But for armour, the belt actually held everything in place. A belt of truth 
should undergird everything that we say and do. It holds everything in place. People can spot a lie very easily, I think. Some people are very perceptive at it. So we need to think truth and we need to speak truth and we need to act in truth. Daniel spoke the truth to Nebuchadnezzar. He could have shied away from doing that. He could have said, oh, king, don't worry about that. That's just, you know, a you know, silly dream about a tree. Don't worry about it. But Nebuchadnezzar was already convicted in his heart. He knew that God was saying something to him and, and, and prompting something there. And so Daniel did it. He spoke the truth. He found the courage to speak it and the wisdom to speak it in love. I remember as a teenager, God gave me a couple of words for, for leaders who were older than me. I remember one, we're in a youth meeting. Some of you have heard me share this before. We're in a youth meeting and I suddenly got this word for, for youth leader and I negated it. I just went, no, that's not from God. That's a silly thought. Well, at the end of this meeting, that particular youth leader got up and said, he goes, we're going to close the, 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 the service now, but he goes, he goes, I just feel like there's a young person here and you've got a word for a leader and but you, you, you don't want to give it. And I thought, oh my goodness. So <laughs> I went up to him afterwards and I said, look, I, I think your word was for me and I think my word is for you. And he's like, oh, okay, right. And, I, and he was slightly crazy, this youth leader. He had a bit of a glint in his eye and a kind of a, a bit of a crazy, nervous laugh, which made it even harder. And so I said to him, well, look, here's, here's the word. God said, you need to stay true to this church at this, this time and not go looking in other places. And he looked at me with that crazy glint in his eye and that slightly nervous smile. And I thought, oh, my gosh. He's going to kill me. He said, my wife's going to be very angry with you. She was a bit crazy as well. I was like, oh my gosh, it's getting worse. He said, we'd been looking around other churches. Hadn't told anybody. He said, a couple of churches had offered me to go and be part of other ministries. He goes, but we were waiting for a word from God. I thought, well, okay. Well, I was glad I was faithful in uh, that situation. Had another one, one of our uh, creative ministry leaders who was 20, 30 years my senior, beautiful lady. Um, we used to have, uh, on Sunday nights, we used to have an extended worship and, and ministry hour. And we were having one of those just down, down here. And I was watching her and, and I was just looking and I'm thinking, yeah, God's really, oh, God's on her, God's doing something in her. And I actually didn't have a word prepared and I went over and I just sat down next to her and I, and I just said, you know what, I feel like God's saying it's time. It's time for a change. And some doors are going to close and some other doors are going to open. It's a pretty generic kind of word. And, um, and she was, her eyes were kind of welled up with tears and she just sort of looked at me and smiled. And, just sort of, and I thought, I've, I've missed it totally. So that's fine. I hope she's encouraged move on well a few days later there's a little letter in my letterbox beautiful pink envelope with flowers on it I thought hello someone sent me a Valentine's Day card or something it was nice anyway it was from this this leader she said you know dear Nathan sorry for the flowery paper it's all I had she said you were spot on she's been God's been talking to me about some changes. You know what? That was scary as a, as a teenager, or, you know, early 20s. Terrified of, you know, having to speak out those words. But it, when it's God's truth, we've got to be faithful to do it. All right. The breastplate of righteousness. The next part of the armour, the breastplate of righteousness in place. What does a breastplate do? Protect your vitals, particularly your heart and lungs. Protecting your heart, guarding your heart. What does it say in Proverbs 23? Guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Guard your heart, even the smallest little things. When we let little attitudes creep in, when we let negative thoughts come in. Like seriously, I'm driving here this morning and my mind just starts to wander a bit. And I have this sort of just slightly negative off thought. 
And I spoke to it straight away. I said, no, I don't want that in there. Here, I'm, I'm trying to prepare myself, thinking about speaking this morning and, and, and sharing the word. And this little thought comes in. I spoke to it straight away. You can do that. See, it's really about putting Jesus on the front door of our heart. It's not about building up a hardness of heart. Sometimes we can assume, if I build a brick wall, don't let anything in, then I'm safe. But you develop a hardness of heart. You can't love God and love people if you have a hardness of heart. But it's about keeping the unrighteous things out, a breastplate of righteousness. Daniel had a track record and a reputation of righteous living. And that's why Nebuchadnezzar uh, respected him. Man, I remember when I was in, again, in high school. I was in a pretty unsanctified high school. There was a culture uh, of, of just smoking, drinking, taking drugs, um, couples sleeping with each other and swearing. I mean, it was, it was pretty bad. And, and during my teenage years, God uh, really worked on my heart and, 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 and I rededicated my life to him and, and was growing in him. And I just remember one lunchtime, I'm there with friends and, uh, and the conversation's going on and, you know, every other word was just cussing, swearing. And, uh, you know, I put up with it for, for a long time and eventually I just said to one of my mates, I said, hey, could, could you maybe just not talk like that around me anymore? I said, so, I mean... And at first he was a bit, oh, well, okay, gosh, you know, I didn't, nobody had ever said that to him. Anyway... It didn't change overnight, but I, I, I watched him. Every now and then he'd drop a word and then suddenly he turned to, oh, sorry about that. But I really felt to, to call it out and say, you know what, I, I don't want that kind of language around me. I, people don't talk like that at church. People don't talk like that at home. I don't want that, that stuff around me. And there's so much in our world today, stuff that can get into our hearts. Maybe it's pornography, maybe it's gambling, maybe it's extremist political views that are out there. Don't let those things hook in. We need a breastplate of righteousness and allow Jesus to discern uh, what's right. And so the next part, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Not just righteous living that guards our heart, but the peace that comes from knowing Jesus. And I like this il illustration of having your feet fitted, having you know the right footwear on. Some of you here probably like going for walks, uh, nice long walks on the beach or in the, in the hills. You've got to have good shoes. If you're going to do that, you can't have crummy old $10 sneakers. You've got to have good shoes to go, to go walking to protect your feet. And our feet have to be fitted. We need to be built on a foundation and a message of peace. Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. See, sometimes we don't always understand everything that is happening to us. And it can be alarming. It can freak us out. Daniel was alarmed, wasn't he? And the king spotted it and he said, Look, don't, don't be alarmed. Just, just give me the message. When I pray for people, quite often... People come in, in, in need of a, a prayer for a miraculous provision or, or healing. Quite often, one of the first things I pray for is that the peace of God that transcends all understanding would come into their hearts. Because I can see they're, they're, they're tied up with anxiety. Or, or they're thinking, God, you just answered my prayer. Healing is exactly what I need, and I want it to happen like this. And that's not always God's way. And so we, we need that peace that transcends what we understand. And, uh, and so I quite often pray for that first. Jesus' life and his message was one of peace. He was born into the world with angels singing, glory to God and peace on earth to all on whom his favour rests. He preached about it in the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers, and his death and his resurrection that took place, all so that we could know the peace of God in our own lives. We've got to stand ready with peace in our life. All right. Now, in addition to all of this, it says, take up the shield of faith with which you extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. You know, sometimes it might feel like you're having fiery darts flicked at you. 
you know, and you can handle one or two, but, you know, on sometimes it might feel like they're coming from every <laughs> which way. And a shield is there, what? To deflect and defend. It's to protect you, to flick away those darts when they come. And some of you might be feeling like that today. You're like, oh, I've got, feel like I've got darts being thrown at me left, right and centre. Daniel really exercised faith under fire. He didn't get personal. He just faithfully stood his ground and shared what he believed and he wasn't moved by the potential consequences of it. And of course, next week, we're going to talk about his greatest test of faith um, and when we look at the story of the lion's den. Got to use the shield of faith. And then take the helmet of salvation. What's a helmet for? Protecting the head. You think of a, a Roman guard's helmet. It's about protecting the mind. We have to always be mindful of our salvation and what that means. Always reflecting on it, always thinking and, and protecting and guarding that. That's why as a church we run things like the New Beginnings course or alpha because we want people to help understand what the christian faith is about what salvation is about what they've won in jesus so that they can stand in the truth of that man we've got to never forget the power of the cross and what was won for for us there you know i only grow more and more in love with the easter story when i hear it you might think, you know, it's not like reruns on television where you think, oh, I've heard this two or three times, I know the ending. The more you hear it, the more you fall in love with Jesus. The more you realise that what he did on the cross was for me, it was for you. It was for all of us. Daniel never forgot his relationship with God and he was very obedient to the call of God on his life. Well, guess what? We've got one step better than that. We've got a relationship with Jesus like a hotline to heaven. And I only grow more and more amazed at, uh, at the wonder of my salvation. In a few moments, we're going to take communion together. I want to encourage you this morning that as you're holding the emblems, as you're reflecting, allow God to remind you about the wonder of your salvation, about the meaning of the cross in your life. Maybe you've never done that before. I want to encourage you to do that this morning. And the final part of the armour, as I bring this to a close, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's about getting to know the Word, this Word. I don't think you can know God better than to know His written Word. But also to learn to recognise His voice when He speaks. It's a living word. It's not a, just a history book. If it was just a history book, it's one of the craziest history books I've ever written, read. It's pretty incredible. We've got to learn to listen for God's voice as well. Daniel knew the law, knew the scriptures, certainly knew the Ten Commandments. But he also knew the voice of God. He heard God interpret that dream and it was right. It's why our daily devotions are so important. That every day as we get up and spend time in the Word and spend time with the Lord, we're not just equipped with a Word. Really, it's like putting on, putting on Jesus. We're equipped with the, the full armour because it's Jesus' truth. It's Jesus' righteousness. It's Jesus' peace. It's His faith by the Holy Spirit working in our life. It's His salvation and it's His Word. Let's have a look at those six things on the screen uh, together there we need each of these working together it's not about one or the other you might go whoa I'm struggling to get my head around one of those you know what it's not in your own strength as you get up each day when you put on Jesus he'll help and guide you through on each one of those things putting on the full armor of God so you can stand firm friends what's God saying to you about standing firm this morning. Maybe some of you have felt a bit shaky, not firm in your walk with Jesus. You can learn to stand, stand firm in your outer world, 
when there are things that are going on that are beyond your control, you can stand in the truth of Jesus. Or standing firm in your inner world, if there are things that are going on for you this morning, I encourage you as we take communion together in just a moment, bring those to Jesus. Lay them at the foot of his cross. You can stand firm. You don't have to be shaken. You can find your sea legs and not be swept left and right. You can stand strong in Jesus, who is the cornerstone, Christ alone. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Let's bow our heads. Thank you, Lord. Father God, I just thank you that you are speaking through these examples this morning, through Daniel, through this story. Lord, through Nebuchadnezzar, how you gave him a second chance and and found a new beginning in you. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for Daniel. Lord, we thank you that we can put on that spiritual armour that is really putting on you, walking with your truth and your righteousness, your peace, your faith, knowing the wonder of salvation in you and the goodness of your word. Lord, for those of us here today who are feeling a little bit shaky, Lord, I pray that we would see ourselves as standing on the rock that cannot be moved, that cannot be shaken. Lord, where external circumstances have caused us maybe even to question our faith. God, reveal yourself afresh to us today as we reflect and are mindful of you. Lord, where there's been internal struggles, things that have troubled us, Lord, that have maybe kept us from walking with you. God, may your light break into our world through the darkness. We turn to you, Lord. We say, have your way this morning, Lord. We love you because you died for us and you rose again so that we could have relationship with you. We pray all these things in your wonderful name and give you the glory. Amen.